The problem with using fats for glycemic control is that combining fats and carbohydrates may or may not be something you always want to do. Now, the jury is still out on this and I'll explain. You can use fats to attenuate your blood glucose, but it's not always the route that I recommend people going. But what we can do is understand which fats have the highest impact on our glucose levels. And then we don't have to be combining fats and carbs with every meal. You see, if you add fats along with carbs, it's going to delay the glucose curve. It's going to make it so you don't spike as much and potentially have a lower spike in insulin. If sheer metabolic health and sheer glucose management is what you are after, this could be a good thing in the long run. I don't want to scare you away from that. But I also have concerns over mixing high amounts of carbohydrates and high amounts of fats. The research is confusing and it's all over the place. But my personal theory on it, based upon what I've seen, is that when you have high amounts of fat and high amounts of carbohydrates together, it may result in what's called metabolic gridlock, where the mitochondria, where we manufacture energy in our cell, they preferentially want to use one fuel or the other, fatty acids or glucose. And they don't really use them both at the same time super, super well, especially when you're moving at a higher intensity. But there's also some concern that by having your glucose elevated by consuming carbohydrates and then taking in fats, it's impeding the ability to utilize those fats very well, meaning they stay circulating. Now, the research is all over the place on this, but I have a solution. Rather than freaking out about that, why don't we focus on utilizing a particular fat that is really, really powerful, or at least the research is starting to show that it's powerful, towards improving glucose management. I put a link down below for 30% off of Seed's Daily Symbiotic. I don't really recommend probiotics very often, but Seed has a very, very interesting one, and that's a 30% off discount link. So they have a capsule inside of a capsule. So it has a prebiotic and a probiotic in one. So if you're trying to really make a dent in your gut microbiome and make a serious change, that's probably the only probiotic I would ever recommend. So again, that link down below will get your hands on that for a 30% off discount, and then you can try taking it every day. So because it's a symbiotic, that means that it has like a multi-stage delivery system. So it has a prebiotic that breaks down, which is going to help feed the gut bacteria and help feed the probiotic, which breaks down a little bit later in digestion with their dual capsule technology. So anyhow, that link is down below for 30% off with seed. I wanna start with a human study that gives us a lot of data and a lot of correlation, and then we'll get into the mechanistic stuff. So there was a study published in Diabetologia that took a look at over 1,000 participants, 1,234 people, okay? And they had them, uh, they actually just measured their circulating levels of what is called palmitoleic acid. Palmitoleic acid is a relatively rare oil in abundance, okay? It is called omega-7, okay? It is a monounsaturated fatty acid and because of its unique structure, it has some potential abilities to modulate inflammation. But what they noticed in this particular research is that those that had higher levels of omega-7s circulating ended up having better insulin sensitivity, they had less liver insulin resistance, and they had better basal cell function when it came down to insulin, and ultimately better sensitivity as far as glucose to an insulin response, to ultimately glucose going into a cell. This is correlational, but it's pretty large scale. And when you start looking at the other data that we have, it's pretty fascinating, okay? Now, sources of omega-7s. You can get omega-7 from olive oil, okay? But you're only talking about 3%. One of the next best sources is going to be avocado oil, okay? But avocado oil, you're looking like anywhere, well, usually up to about 13%. Then you have what are called sea buckthorn berries, which you can get. And those are a pretty rich source of omega-7s, but they're hard to really add into the diet. Then you have macadamia nuts, where you're looking 17 to 20-ish percent omega-7s. So now let's go a little bit more granular, and let's look at the in vitro stuff so we have some potential mechanisms. So in this particular study, it was molecular nutrition and food research. They induced inflammation in cells by treating them with high amounts of saturated fats. They induced inflammation and increased IL-6 and IL-8 in response to tumor necrosis factor. Essentially what that means, they created inflammation. When they treated with palmitoleic acid or oleic acid, the palmitoleic acid reduced IL-6 and IL-8. So it reduced the inflammation in those cells. Oleic acid did not. 
So working backwards, what we can sort of elucidate from this and speculate is that it has to do with the anti-inflammatory effect. So this potential anti-inflammatory effect is making it so that the signal for insulin and signal from glucose to the liver, ultimately to the pancreas, is all better. Now, researchers are speculating a few reasons, one of which is improvement in glycogen synthesis. So what this means in simple terms is that somehow omega-7s are making it so that the glucose that's circulating in our system can absorb into the muscle as glycogen better. So meaning you're storing the carbohydrates for later use rather than just having them circulate, contributing to high glucose levels and ultimately high HbA1c. Now, additionally, they are finding that it increases glucose flux, which basically helps metabolites and energy be used through aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. And then there's also improvements in GLUT1 and GLUT4 sensitivity. So what this means is that the cells are simply able to utilize the glucose better. So this might be one of the best fats long term. So how do you use it to potentially improve insulin sensitivity and get more out of it? My recommendation is that you consume macadamia nut oil or you consume avocado oil or some of these fats that are rich in omega-7, you consume them with lean protein. Okay, consume them with lean protein so you're getting them absorbed in a way that they're circulating for a higher amount of time. I don't think it's a good idea to add them to carbohydrates unless you have to, but if you're, say, cooking some potatoes in oil or you are cooking some other kind of carbohydrate in oil, which we do in any kind of culinary setting, I highly recommend you cook carbs in macadamia nut oil. Because of the B vitamin content and because of the omega-7s, it might allow you to utilize those carbs better and have less of a spike. So in a world where we combine fats and carbs, even if we maybe shouldn't, well, the best kind of oil you can use is going to be something that's rich in omega-7s. That's my opinion, at least. Now, the smoke point of, say, macadamia nut oil is about 410 degrees. So you can cook at a decent temp and not denature or oxidize the fat. Monounsaturated fats are also quite stable, so they're not that bad, right? Now, on the other side of the equation, you could use something like avocado oil if you're putting in an air fryer that's getting really, really hot. Because avocado oil, although not super high in omega-7s, still 13% is a decent amount. So I want you to treat your macadamia nut oil as something that you kind of add in throughout the course of the day with all your foods, so you increase your circulating blood levels of it. Now, with olive oil, these other oils, you can use those as supplement, you can use those as different forms. By all means, they're still tremendous oils. But we might want to start looking at this fat as it really is showing some promising results. I'll see you tomorrow.